returning? All right, we got to out drink the rookies tonight. That's how we're going to do this. All right, so how's everybody doing tonight? We're doing good? Ready to hear some space talks? That's a little low energy, you know. How are we doing tonight? We doing okay? All right, all right, that's better, that's better, that's better. All right, so, oh yes, I have to introduce the team. Um, I am Aaron. Uh, I am one of the hosts of AOT. This is? Sam Hart. And this is? Michael Velez. And this is? Tracy. And you know where we are. This is Astronomy on Tap. We and have Adam and Brian over here. Oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> this is the first time I have done the intro, so I am learning. Uh, yes, we have Adam and Brian who are essentially running the show. And then, so Michael, take it away. Yes. What is Astronomy on Tap? For those of you who this is your first time, you're wondering why are we here, um, it is a worldwide phenomenon. There are actually Astronomy on Taps all over the globe. Um, it started uh, just over 10 years ago, actually, in Brooklyn, New York. And we started up about six years ago, so um, now it's, uh, as you can see, all those pins are where our locations are. It's always a lot of fun. Thank you for coming. Now, what do we do specifically at our Astronomy on Tap? Well, we have fun. <laughs> we have very interesting talks. They're interactive because you will get to ask questions. That's why the phone number is on this television screen over there, so that if you have any pressing questions, you can ask them uh, to the speakers and a chance to win because of the night uh, where uh, three lucky teams will get a variety of prizes, including so we have a mug and a poster. That is us. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we get into our talks, we actually have some announcements because uh, there's a big eclipse coming up next month. Yeah. Uh, after the announcements, we'll get a talk on eclipses by Rick Varner, and then we'll have a break where Caleb will give us astronomy in the news, and finally, uh, Dr. William Cosman will talk to us about the Voyager satellites traversing the outer reaches of our solar system. So for our announcements, I'm going to try and go through them quick. There's no astronomy on tap next month. I know, I know. Uh, but there's good reason. Tracy's too busy, so we can't do it. <laughs> uh, there is a big conference going on, a planetary science conference. Uh, so it was just a little too busy. We couldn't do it. But this conference has three public events, and those three are here on Monday, so this is the week that would be Astronomy on Tap. Uh, that Monday, we have some stargazing and eclipse preparation at the Mission San Jose Library. Uh, on Tuesday, the following day, Robert Reeves will be giving a keynote talk at the Trinity University's Laurie Auditorium. Robert, please stand up or wave your hand, yeah, there he is. Uh, he will also be one of several panelists doing an AMA, and then there will also be stargazing at that event. Uh, Wednesday, there's a not a public event, so you can't go anywhere. Uh, I guess you could come here, but nobody will be here. And then on Thursday, our own Tracy Becker won the Carl Sagan Public Outreach uh, Award. Yeah. There she is. And so we expect you all to be there Thursday at the UTSA Buena Vista Theater. She will give a wonderful lecture on space exploration. Again, Thursday, October 5th, 7 p.m., be there. And also go to Robert Reeves' talk as well. Plenty of stuff to do that week. Plenty of astronomy-related stuff. And then next week is the eclipse, which Tracy will tell you about now. So who here knows that we're having an eclipse overhead in San Antonio <laughs> next month? That's right. So we're going to hear tons about it from Rick coming up. Um, but as you can see on this map here, we are really fortunate that the entire city of San Antonio will be in the line of seeing the full annular eclipse. 
Uh, it begins at 10.23 in the morning on Saturday, October 14th, and peaks at 11.54 and wraps up at 1.33. So we've got all day to really get to check out this really cool event. And there are events going on all over the city for this event. Um, you can go, you could just step outside in your backyard if you want to, uh, stand in the street if you want to, uh, whatever you want to do. But it might be more fun to celebrate it with other people who are excited about the eclipse as well. And so there are a number of different events. You can go to the website that's listed at the top, or you could probably Google this somehow and find this map. Um, but this map shows a couple of the events. There probably are others by now. Uh, we might hear about some at SCOBY. Will we have a, okay, great. Um, so we'll endorse the SCOBY one right now. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's gonna be a lot of places where there'll be family activities uh, to go and actually experience eclipse with other people. Um, and if you're interested in actually being more a part of the eclipses, uh, you can become an eclipse ambassador. Uh, we're having a volunteer training event uh, in two weeks from now. This is on the text is very small, but Monday, September 18th at the Central Library downtown. So if you're interested in actually um, learning how to conduct some of these outreach activities and then going to places like SCOBY or the Witty or the Museum where they're hosting events, you can go there and bring some of your knowledge and, and expertise that you'll have gained from this volunteer training um, and then use that for those students and uh, families and whoever's at the event. So if you're interested, yeah, there's a QR code. Um, and I can also just, uh, we, we're gonna be sharing this on our social media uh, so you can look there too for more information. Um, but we need people to sign up. So if you're interested, sign up soon so we know that we actually have enough people to actually host this event. So. Uh, and then with that, let me get my phone here. We are very, very excited uh, to have Rick Varner of the SCOBY Education Center here with us tonight. Um, his talk is going to be, well, it's gonna be on eclipses. Don't be blinded by the light. Uh, <laughs> but real quick, his bio. So Rick graduated from the University of Florida with two education-based degrees. After several years as an educator and administrator, Rick found himself working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center as an education specialist. While at NASA, Rick was involved with, among other things, planning the opening of the Discovery and Enterprise Space Shuttle exhibits at multi multiple museums and assisting in the final servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. After seven years at NASA, Rick had forgotten the Alamo <laughs> as Penance, I don't think he wrote this, right? <laughs> as Penance, he joined the SCOBY Education Center as its first director in 2014 and has been working there ever since. Uh, Rick's other interests include collecting sports memorabilia, making art, listening to vintage rock and roll, and narrating NASA educational videos. So we're very excited to have Rick here. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. told if I pick something like sun, you just won't hear any of the presentation. <laughs> Let's do solar. Let's do solar. It sounds a little more scientific. Uh, for those who have never done this before, when uh, now when Rick says the word solar, everyone's going to do, and then take a sip of your drink, but drive, get home safely, too. All right. And if you're listening out there somewhere else, don't drink and drive, right? Um, First, to get a sense of who I'm talking with, how many of you are heliophysicists? Have currently have uh, <laughs> spacecraft orbiting planets? Okay, good, that helps me a little bit. <coughs> if you've not been to the SCOBY Education Center, this is our building, it's kind of unique in its design. It's placed in the middle of the San Antonio College campus, and we just recently opened the San Ticos Micronaut Center. I'm that guy at the end of the films, if you go into the movies, thank you, enjoy the show, that's me now. And so that center is directed mostly at young kids. We, we call them micronauts, the little astronauts. And so um, we are, our mission is to bring life-changing opportunities for children in our community. And the goal is to drive them into the STEM career pathways. <coughs> okay, there we go. So this is a, a more of a zoomed in version of the map that you saw earlier. Uh, these are the two pathways for the total eclipse and the annular eclipse. And you can see that San Antonio is kind of bisected in that right-hand side. Uh, SCOBY is perfectly aligned for the annular eclipse, 
but not for the total eclipse. Let me find the sweet spot for the echo and such. There we go. Um, so when the total eclipse comes around, we're telling people don't go to the planetarium. We're going to go to Northwest Vista or somewhere else. UTSA will have a community event out there. Um, Kerrville will be very busy. NASA is promoting their activities out there as well. Uh, but you see the times up here. Um, there's a couple of really great maps out there that you can put your address into, and it'll give you the exact amount of exposure and time frames for your particular location. And so we've been sharing those out because the, with the annular eclipse in particular, you cannot look at the sun at any time. You always have to have protective eyewear or filters. The total eclipse has that nice window of time where you can have that very unique experience to look at the sun without any protective gear. And so this is pretty much what we're gonna see. Um, there is a, a lunar eclipse coming, but it's gonna be one that people probably won't even notice. Uh, for us, the, the most important ones will be that annular eclipse again in October and the total eclipse again in April. And so we get the question all the time, and, and believe it or not, this is one real question we get. Why did you schedule it on a Monday? That's a real question I get on the phone, okay? Um, I, I'm impressed that they think that we have that control, but. Uh, so, so why doesn't it happen every month? And given that background, uh, kind of a cool little animation. Again, it's about the phases. I even have my socks on to say going through phases. Um, the, the idea that a, an eclipse only happens during a full moon or a new moon. And it doesn't happen every time, because we've got that little inclination of, uh, out of the, the plane that all the planets are on. And so when, when the planes cross with the, the orbit of the moon, we have the opportunity, if it, if it works out, that it's a new moon or a full moon. And uh, there's a, um, another question that comes with this. Why does, why does one eclipse serve as an annual or a ring of fire eclipse? And why is one a... Uh, a total eclipse. And so we get into the idea that the moon is at different places in its orbit. It's at perigee or apogee. And I, I, because I'm a teacher, I like to think of ways for kids to remember things. And so apogee is when it's away, it's farther away in its orbit. Perigee, of course, is when it's closer. So when it's a little farther away and it lines up, we get the annular eclipse because it doesn't focus just right to give us that point. A really quick activity. Remember there was a comedy routine, I'm squeezing your head, you know, uh, like Saturday Night Live? If you simply take your thumb and you hold it out at, at arm's length and put it in front of something at a distance that is bigger than your thumb, eventually you, you close one eye, you eventually can bring your thumb in so that it completely blocks whatever that object is. And that's the idea here, is that the moon lines up so that at, at a greater distance it doesn't completely block the bigger object, but when it's closer in it does. And, and that's where we get the, the shadowing that creates the eclipse. Uh, w the difference between perigee and apogee is about 12, 14%. And these are actual images that are scaled from the Galileo spacecraft. And um, I was one of those guys that took the pictures and then just put the little lines on there and measured it out. So how much really? And uh, so it is, it's about this difference. And then now, because of media or something, we've got super moons all over the place. <laughs> and um, it's not like we've never had them before, but now they're all super. And, um, and so it's, it, this is back in the conversation as well. And of course, this is what we expect to see. Uh, the difference, and this is one of the things that we, we like to point out is in, in this image, um, you see that the, the background is black it's not black during an annular eclipse. You know, you, when you're looking through your special filtered glasses, it will look like this. But the sky is not dark. It darkens somewhat, it cools off somewhat, but it's not gonna be like a total eclipse where you look up and you could see the planets and the stars in the, in the midday sky that you couldn't see before. You're gonna see you know, the, the brightness of the sky at some, de some degrees. And so with, with an annular eclipse, you should never look up at the sun like this. There are some politicians who are famously <laughs> caught in pictures doing that. You should always have your protective glasses 
or the filters over your telescopes or the different instruments that you would use. And again, with the total eclipse, the moon is at, at, at the Goldilocks place. It's just right to block out and make a perfect little shadow on the surface. That swath is about 100 miles across. So for Texas, Kerrville is kind of in the middle of that swath as it moves up across our state. Kerrville, Fredericksburg, and up in that direction. There's one small area, of, uh, I want to say a state park, south southeast of Kerrville. That's like the middle of the target for both eclipses. And I'm sure if there's a and b there, the rooms are $1,000 a night or something. <laughs> um, I, I've, we were on a, a <coughs> STEM council meeting this morning, and one of the, the people in the, in the meeting was talking about her, uh, her grandmother is renting out her yard to campers now and you know, getting great dollars for it. And she said, I'm going to stay at my grandmother's house. And we reminded her she'll probably get a good rate. And if, uh, if you've never been on the space station, me included, this is what it looks like from space. This is an older image from the Mir spacecraft and uh, looking back at a total eclipse. And there's a, a wonderful activity that our UTSA folks are going to be doing at the uh, training, the activity I think on maybe fr on Saturday, but definitely at the volunteer training where they'll do a, a scale model with dowels on a yardstick or meter stick and you'll see these little dots when you get the scale just right. And when I do that with teachers, you hear them kind of gasp. Because even though they're teachers and they teach this, when they physically see this and they make the model, there's a connection that stays with them. And all of a sudden, they explain it differently to their students. And that's what we're hoping to do when we do the volunteer program, to have those aha moments that translate to all the guests that they, they work with in the next six months. And of course, this is why you want to be in a really good place for totality. This is a little fancier than you probably would see just looking up. Uh, but it's, it is uh, the way that, that uh, Angela Speck tells us it is a life-changing opportunity when you get out there to, to see when it is. And she said that after she went to the first one, she travels around the world to go to as many of them as she can. And uh, it is, it's something I'm looking forward to for my first one. This is the maps that I referred to earlier. You want to take a picture of that screen if you've got your phones. Uh, this is one of my favorite tools. And uh, this is the, the address and map set up specifically for SCOBY. And you can see the SCOBY is not 100%. So that means we're not in totality. And uh, I don't want to have two partial eclipses. I want to have a partial in the total. So that's why we're booking it out of there on April 8th. But you can put in your address and zoom into your location, and it'll give you all of this data for your particular address. And so if you're in a school, if you're at the workplace, wherever, you'll know if during the total eclipse, are you actually in totality or not? And how far away from it are you? Because you can then move west or east and go to places where it will work for you. And then just this week, there was the interactive map for the um, not the total eclipse, are they the same one? No, there it is. The annular eclipse is this, the one above that, and that's just recent. So you can also see how well aligned your area is for annularity as well. So a very cool, cool tool. Uh, this is why you don't look at the sun during these eclipses. If, if you've ever seen the, the TV and movies and stuff where kids are burning ants on the sidewalk, your eye has a lens and if you look at the sun for an extended period of time, you're essentially going to be burning the back of your eye. And it's not like that goes away. And so you, you don't want to create another unnatural blind spot in the back of your eye. That's why you use the, the protective gear to look up. Uh, these are pictures that came from the, the last one that we had in 2017. The, the, um, the trees create beautiful little pinhole viewers for you. You just have to look down. Uh, there was a food truck at, at SCOBY in 2017. And there were people all lined up complaining that they, we had run out of the, the glasses for them to look at the eclipse. And I said, well, you know, you're looking at the eclipse right now. They're all looking down at the sidewalk complaining. And I said, look, there it is right there. And there was this 50 people in line, and they all went, oh, no, wow. <laughs> they forgot to order. They were all watching the, uh, the eclipse through the leaves. And you can simply put your fingers together and make a little crossing 
and do the exact same thing. What I have on the table there to give to all of you is this. That's the, um, the official pinhole viewer from the Punch Mission, which is a Southwest Research Institute mission. And um, we'll have folks from uh, Punch here during the planetary meetings in October, if I'm not mistaken, right? And then the one on the left, I got permission from the, uh, the Great Eclipse website to use this graphic, and we have that printed out on cardstock. And all you have to do is poke a hole through that little place that is our spot in the middle, and that'll be a, a pinhole viewer too. And, and you, can, you don't have to do fancy stuff. You can poke it through an envelope or something and do the same thing, or just cross your fingers and let it go through. Uh, we have um, a community anchor grant with NASA, so I have 5,000 of these glasses ordered, and I begged NASA give me more. So uh, we may have like 10,000 of these to give out. We're gonna give them out for free, then we'll sell ours after they're gone. Um, we're expecting about 5,000 people at the event at SCOBY on Saturday, October 14th. And we'll have a whole bunch of community folks there, including our friends from Southwest uh, Research Institute. <coughs> if you're concerned about your kids, this is a really cool creative way to help give them a little extra margin of safety. Uh, it's simply cut out a, a paper plate and it creates kind of a shield around there. One of the things that we're gonna do is I've got a, this PVC contraption on my second floor we bought a bunch of that Mylar film, the protective filter, and we're gonna create an awning. So if there's people that can't use the glasses or can't do this kind of thing, that they'll be able to stand under the awning and look up and uh, see the filtered sun that way. And of course, you can have telescopes. Our friends from SAAA are here. Uh, Robert in the back is working with us with Celestron Telescope as well. They're gonna be videotaping or, or filming the entire annular eclipse on the star deck at SCOBY. And, uh, and that'll become part of their archives of uh, celestial videos for later. Um, and this one on the right is the Coronado that we got with a NASA grant, and that'll be available for the public when we get there. Uh, we also have a, a grant with the Boeing company. We bought a bunch of these, and um, we had 21 teachers in a workshop with us at the end of July. Each one of them got two of these to bring back to their schools and we'll have some of them also set up a SCOBY. <coughs> Don't do these things. You're gonna start to see all this stuff in social media about people who will use film negatives, or do this, or if you stand this way with your leg up, and uh, weird things that don't work, and you, you don't know they don't work until you get hurt. So only do the, the certified filtered glasses the lenses and things that are designed for the s looking at the sun. Don't do the, the stuff that I know a guy who said. Um, welding glasses work, but they have to be higher than that number 14. So if you go to like a, a home renovation store or something and you buy welding glasses, make sure that it's rated at a greater darkness than that. Most of them are not at that level, and that's what you have to be really careful of as well. And th these are the actual ones from, uh, that we got printed with the NASA grant, and uh, those are the ones we'll be giving away for free. Questions, and I know I went more than 10 minutes for this. Okay. <laughs> that was fast for me, I can talk about this stuff for a whole day, so. Any questions, or answers, answers too, yes. Um, oh, we have a uh, hand raised. Um, let me, if, uh, I don't know how easy it is to get up here because I'd like for everyone to hear your question. Um, do you have a, a phone? Can I call yes, there we go. And I'll repeat the question. So the question was, as the moon moves farther away, this is also for online people, um, how, uh, how many more years do we have of these eclipse opportunities? Uh, I just realized I don't have Fred Espinac's number on my phone anymore. Um, there's a guy called Fred Espinac who's a Mr. Eclipse on the internet, and he has mathematically calculated stuff for like a million years. Um, he's amazing. Uh, I know that they say that the distance is a, a, about the width of a dime 
And so I know that it's going to be an extended period of time. Uh, we'll have a whole lot of other things to worry about if that happens, though. Yes. Um, okay, so, um, well, first of all, I noticed you went almost pretty much the entire talk without saying the, the magic word, so. I didn't that's say a, solar? That's a first. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, is the intensity of the solar eclipse <laughs> woo, stronger than usual Sundays? Sun, not Sunday, the day, sun, the usual sun. I don't know. Whoever worded this, do better. Uh, <laughs> um, referencing the sunglasses comment. We prefer sunny days, yes. Yes. Although, I mean, I, I, I'll say myself, I hope you're not looking at the sun with your sunglasses. But, <laughs> but yes, so is, does the intensity of the cha sun change, or is it roughly the same? The sun is the sun. I mean, it's got the same reactor going the whole time. And uh, what's different is that when you've got an eclipse type of environment going on, you've got some of that energy uh, diluted, if you would. And so you, you feel like you can look at it, but you're still getting exposed to the radiation and the, the power that can cause damage to your eye. And so it's, um, it, it's kind of like we're in this room and you know, we can look up at these lights but if, if you were to go out and, and see a, a single light of the similar brightness in a different environment, it may have impact your eyes differently. You know, you, your iris will open and close differently, and if it opens more because it feels like it's darker, you're actually gonna be uh, potentially causing more damage. Thank you. I have any optometrists in the room who can verify that? <laughs> yes, sir. So the question is, if it's overcast, will be there be something televised? One of the things that we're planning at SCOBY is that we, we have a planetarium, and we can connect to the internet. And so when, uh, when 2017 rolled around, we were, um, we were projecting NASA imagery on there that was coming from Oregon or someplace else. And so for us, that's an option. If it's cloudy here, it's a mixed bag because we really need the rain, but it, it's um, not on that day. That's, uh, but it, it's, um, we're gonna have a whole community of people there, and I imagine all the folks who are having different events set up are gonna have other things going on. Because you're really looking, for, even in annularity, you're looking at about four minutes. <coughs> Excuse me, so in that four minutes, if it takes you an hour to drive somewhere, you should kinda get an hour's worth of something out of it while you're there, right? So we're gonna have uh, 12 or 13 tents of different community groups set up, we have a whole row of food trucks setting up out there. Inside SCOBY, we'll have activities for kids. Like, have you ever made solar cookies before? They really have nothing to do with solar. Um, <laughs> they're, they're sugar cookies, and you decorate them like, you know, prominences and stuff. But, um, but they're really popular, and when the little ones are complaining, they stop complaining when they get solar cookies. Eclipse coming up at four minutes. The one uh, in 2017 was about two minutes. How long is the longest eclipse mm. possible? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I know that the, um, the one that, where's that? Hawaii was six. Hawaii was six. Um, and I'm told that the one that it's gonna be in Egypt is supposed to be really long. Okay. Um, and if you're, if you're not paying attention, we can ask Angie. She's probably got a tickets already. There, one of the total eclipses is going to be over like the Valley of Kings in Egypt. And so talk about a Raiders of the Lost Ark moment. Um, that'll be really amazing. And I understand they have really bad roads <laughs> getting in and out of there. Um, but I understand that should be like six minutes too. I'm not sure exactly. Um. I have a question from the, from the phone here. Can the eclipse be seen safely by a reflection in a bucket filled with water? I actually had somebody t describe this to me the other day. What this person described was using a pinhole viewer, kind of like the ones you should be getting from the punch mission here. And he, he made a pinhole viewer and he put a mirror on the floor. 
and he did the pinhole viewer on the mirror, and then it shot up to the ceiling, creating a longer length. And so he had this big projection of the sun on the ceiling. And so as long as you're not look, if it's going up to like a reflective surface or something, you're looking at that, that's not going to be the same potential of damage. Um, but I thought that was brilliant. To, the one thing I would be really aware of, how many of you drive up the roads like 281 and there's the buildings that are one big huge building reflector? Those are the ones I always worry about, you know, where you, <laughs> there's humongous mirrors that are set up in the driveways. Um, but that shouldn't be a problem if it's reflected onto something you're looking at. Yes. I don't remember what the day is. I just know that it's, I don't have any kind of frequent flyer miles to go do that. <laughs> yeah, I think, again, it's, that's one of those things that's just, yeah, amazing. Another question. Why did the times change? Yeah, the um, let's, let's um, because of the angle in which the, the shadow is lined up, um, as the earth is rotating and the moon is moving, you, you've got, uh, I think for our, our total eclipse, when you're farther down toward Mexico, the time is even longer. Uh, it's, closer, it's closer to five minutes, isn't it, at that point? Like if you go down toward the, the US-Mexican border, and then as you go up toward Buffalo, it gets shorter. So it's, it's stretching out the, the intensity of the path. Just like if you're in the middle of the eclipse, you know, in that midline, like Kerrville will be four and a half minutes, San Antonio is like two and a half minutes. Like my house is in the eclipse, my workplace is not. Um, you know, it's, it's location, location, location. Any realtors in the room? <laughs> yeah. Yes. The 7.5 is the, ma is the longest possible. Well, we and that's not going to be ours, but 7.5. We actually have a really good time for what we're getting. But we also found out that the Egypt one is August 2nd, 2027. So book your flights now. <laughs> um, oh, uh, no, those will be changed 80 times between yeah. now and then. So. Um, let's thank our speaker once again. Thank, thank you so much. All right, um, we are going on a little break here, a 10 minute break. Uh, so feel free to freshen up on your drinks or food. Uh, be sure don't crowd the bar, order from your wait staff in the room. And um, we'll be back in 10 minutes with the rest of our program.
uh, if you would indulge us for a little bit. Thanks. Uh, yeah, what did you guys all think about learning a little bit about the eclipse? Yeah. All right. Well, if you're hopped up on the moon right now, uh, you heard earlier that Robert Reeves is going to be our speaker for the Trinity event next month. Um, he also recently just published a book. So there's actually information up here about that book, about his incredible astrophotography that he does. So if you're interested, come up and get some flyers about his book. Thanks. <laughs> it's a knee slapper. Uh, all right, so we're going to have our um, regularly scheduled programming of Astronomy in the News by our own Caleb Gamar, and I swear one day I want to get in that dun -dun 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 -dun, you know, sound with the news one day. It'll come, I swear. But anyways, here's... I can get more of the PowerPoint. That, yeah, there we go. It, it's coming. Uh, uh, c come back two months from now. All right, here's Caleb Gamar with Astronomy in the News. Oh, all right, thank you. Okay, so for this month's edition of Astronomy in the News, we'll go ahead and start with the skies of September. So if you go outside and look up at the sky, you are starting to exit the summer season and enter the fall season. So the eastern half of your sky will be mostly fall time constellations, while the western half of your sky will still be very much uh, the summer season sky. Now, because of that, you want to, if you would like to see many of the wonders of the Milky Way galaxy, go out and observe the skies, well, now. Because if you do not uh, see the Milky Way in all of its glory right now, uh, you will lose out that opportunity as we go on into October and then definitely into November. Uh, much of that very dense part of the Milky Way will start setting over there toward the west, and so make sure to get your views now toward the core of our galaxy where there's quite a bit of, um, well, basically star clusters, gaseous material, things like that. You'll find a lot of open star clusters there, a lot of star forming nebulae. I have a couple of them highlighted here. M11, what's called the Wild Ducks Cluster, uh, found right about there in the sky. And the Eagle Nebula, M16, uh, found right there. Uh, again, you can see these things as very faint little smudges of light under a very dark sky with a good pair of binoculars. So indeed, go outside and see those while you still can. Saturn is front and center in the skies uh, the, during the evening time in September. Of course, you do have to wait for it uh, a little later than that 10 p.m. time in order to be right front in the middle of the sky. However, it certainly is very well placed throughout the evening no matter what. So uh, do keep in mind there is a nice visible planet in the sky. So now for the first news story. Rather interesting discovery about Neptune. Uh, using data from the Hubble Space Telescope and from the Keck Observatories at Mauna Kea and Hawaii, uh, a group of astronomers has established a link between the high altitude cloud features visible on Neptune and the solar cycle, the solar sunspot cycle, or the solar activity cycle to be more specific. So about every 11 years, you have a peak in sun activity uh, denoted by an increase in number of sunspots visible in the uh, sun's photosphere. And interestingly enough, this correlates pretty well, actually I should say the other way around, Neptune's cloud cover features correlate with this solar activity. Now there's a lot more work to be done understanding this link. What most likely is taking place is of course there's variations in the amount of ultraviolet light emitted by the sun uh, depending on where you're at in this uh, solar cycle. And uh, during times of greater UV exposure, the, uh, those cloud features uh, start to increase. And then as the activity goes down, it decreases. So very interesting discovery from those observatories. Now, for yet another very fascinating discovery from a ground-based telescope, uh, the Canada France Hawaii Telescope at Mauna Kea was used to observe a member of a binary star system, HD 4, uh, 45166. It's about 3,000 light years away, and it was found that this binary member was a very, very highly magnetic system, a star, uh, and it was a helium rich star, what's called a, a helium star. 
So basically, a lot of the hydrogen, its outer atmosphere, has long since been uh, blown away by very intense stellar winds. And this star could be a progenitor of what's called a magnetar. So when it goes supernova, and this star is massive enough to do so, it will collapse into a highly magnetized neutron star. And it, there's very little understood about how magnetars actually do come into existence. So it's thought that maybe this helium-rich, highly magnetic star uh, is what leads to, or, or is at least a possible version of something that leads to one of these uh, magnetars. So very, very interesting work there. And then something from a radio telescope array. So the Atacama Large Millimeter Array was used to map the magnetic field of a galaxy that is the farthest such magnetic field mapping ever accomplished. This has a light look back time of 11 billion years. So it's 11 billion light years light travel distance. The galaxy is probably much farther away than that by now. But you are looking at it, it's appeared about 11 billion years ago. This is a visible light image. Right here is the ALMA image. And how this was accomplished is that there's these uh, very fine dust particles in, uh, well, basically in uh, interstellar space within galaxies. They're linear particles. And these linear particles line up and they result in a polarized uh, either reflection or, uh, or absorption of light. So in this case, uh, the particles actually vibrate at a certain uh, frequency which results in radio waves being emitted. These are polarized and so looking at the uh, polarization of these radio waves you can make a magnetic field map because again the particles are going to line and emit the radio frequencies based off the uh, prevailing magnetic fields. So this is the farthest such uh, mapping that has ever been accomplished. Really remarkable stuff. And many of you have heard India landed their first lander on the moon toward the lunar south pole. Really fascinating mission. They are only the fourth country to land any mission on the moon. Not only that, this is the first lander to land toward the lunar south pole. Very, very fantastic uh, accomplishment here. And this uh, lander, which was named Vikram, carried a small rover called Pragyan on board. If, I rem if I'm right, it is still operating. Last I heard, the lander actually made a very slight hop using its thrusters across the surface. I think that uh, news story was posted on August 30th about the uh, lander hopping across the surface. Now, not everyone has been so successful. The Russians tried. Yeah, Luna 25, it was their first attempt at a robotic lunar landing mission since the 1970s. It launched successfully, it, here's a, a photograph of the launch, of course a very well-known Russian type uh, rocket, a, a derivative of the R7 series, a Soyuz 2 rocket, launched uh, during the middle of August. Uh, Luna 25 is on its way there, had a failure toward the latter part of the mission, and it crashed on the lunar surface. And from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, we observed, well, this crater that is the last of Luna 25. So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes things just don't work the way you want them to. But nonetheless, you have to give them a pat on the back for trying. So some do not miss events. One, this Friday, at the observatory on the UTSA campus, Curtis Vaughn Jr. Observatory, we will be having our uh, Friday night celestial lights. Now, this is the second observing of the month that we do. I will remind everyone we have changed the frequency at which we do these observings. Uh, we used to do first and third Friday. They are now first and second Friday. This one coming up is the second Friday, and the second Friday one has a couple of lectures that take place before the observing. I will be giving the first lecture that evening. I'm going to be talking about uh, basically uh, starting out in amateur astronomy, what you need to do in order to get involved in the hobby. And then I don't know what the topic of the second lecture is. I'm going to guess that uh, Dr. Schlegel is going to be giving that lecture at UTSA, but we'll see who and what the lecture is about. So uh, a few other events. We've already heard about the solar eclipses. Don't miss them. CRISM and SLIM launch. So Japan is launching a, a X-ray space telescope uh, called CRISM and then a small uh, lunar lander called SLIM. Uh, 
that might have launched this evening. I haven't kept up with the news this evening to know if it didn't launch this evening, that launch will be coming up very soon, so watch out for that. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission sample return is happening on September 24th, so if all goes according to plan, on September 24th, the uh, reentry capsule carrying samples from the asteroid Bennu will uh, enter the Earth's atmosphere and uh, will be recovered uh, successfully. So do watch out for that event coming up. And then finally, Psyche, that asteroid mission will launch on October 5th. And this has been a long-awaited launch. It was supposed to happen last year. It didn't wind up happening last year for various technical reasons. Uh, they are on track to launch on October 5th. So very much anticipating that mission getting off the ground. Also, one more note on the Friday night star observings. Since we do not have a astronomy on tap this coming month, uh, we will be doing those observings at UTSA in September, the first Friday in September and the second Friday in September. Sorry, in October. October, right? <laughs> first Friday in October, second Friday in October. So do bear those in mind. Last but not least, a couple of parting images for you from the James Webb Space Telescope. One very nice one of the Ring Nebula here, and one of the remnant left over from Supernova 1987A. So two examples of very different end stages of a star's life. Uh, in the case of Ring Nebula, uh, for a star like our own sun, this is the way it ends its life, just sloughing its outer layers away in the distant space, leaving behind a white dwarf star in the center. And then for a very, very massive star, much more massive than our own sun, Supernova takes place, sometimes leaving behind a gassy remnant, and many times a neutron star or even a black hole. So that is where I will leave you. Thank you, and that has been Astronomy in the News. Thank you, Caleb. Yes, yeah, so Cyrus Rex, New Frontiers number three, the first two New Horizons and Juno, Sweary's own spacecraft. Um, if, uh, uh, not many people, but some people had questions. Uh, find Caleb after the program and he'll answer them for you. Um, he's always helpful. So now we're gonna move to our final uh, talk for tonight, which will be given by Dr. William Cosman, discussing Voyager's family portrait of the solar system. A little bit about William. He earned his bachelor's of science in a astronautical engineering at MIT in 1975. And after 40 years of twiddling his thumbs, he obtained his master's and PhD at George Washington University. Throughout his career, William has been involved with many satellite programs, including the Meteor Defense Program, the International Space Station, Voyager's Grand Tour, the Orbital Sciences Space Commercial Resupply, the upcoming Punch Mission, which you all got the cards for, and the upcoming Solaris Mission. So to discuss the beautiful Voyager mission. Here is Dr. William Cosman. <laughs> what is your word for this evening? Oh, we're, I'm going to do what I did the last time. We're going to have two words. <laughs> Actually, fam, family uh, portrait will be the first word, <laughs> and UTSA will be the second word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how does this thing work? Okay, so three times we've launched spacecraft that had cameras, spacecraft that were going out away from the sun, never to return. So three times we've had opportunities to turn the cameras around and take pictures of our home solar system. We're gonna talk about two of those opportunities tonight and I'll briefly allude to the third opportunity which would be with New Horizons and that's TBD whether it's going to happen or not. Okay, so the first two opportunities were with Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. The space were launched in 1977, the first go by Jupiter, and then Saturn, and Voyager 2 went on to Uranus and Neptune. Early in the mission, Carl Sagan had the idea of using the Voyager cameras to take at least one, if not three, images of the Earth. If you take one image, it would be a black and white image. If you take three images through different color filters, and you can reconstruct a natural color image. So what I'm going to tell you is about all of the different times 
Sagan requested that this observation be made, <laughs> and the not only no, but hell no, go away and don't come back ever again <laughs> response he got from the Voyager Project Office. And there were good reasons for the response, but Sagan persevered. Okay, so what ultimately worked was the result of all of these different requests. This is a table in a paper that uh, myself and Candy Hansen wrote, and we have Carl Sagan on, listed as a posthumous co-author on the paper. Um, I'll get to the history of the paper a little bit later, but so the, in 1981 in the summer, Sagan first asked the Voyager Project if we could use the cameras to take a picture of the Earth, and by timing the image, you could get some other things involved or show up in the picture too. This thing's also a laser pointer, isn't it? No? That guy, okay. So if you time the picture right, you could take a picture of the Earth and you could also get Jupiter and Saturn in the picture, okay? Voyager Project said no. Okay, we got more planets upcoming, right? This was after the Voyager 1 and 2 Jupiter and Saturn encounters, but Voyager 2 still had encounters coming up with Uranus and Neptune, and Voyager 1 was used as an engineering test bed in support of the Voyager 2 encounters. So the project office and by extension NASA headquarters did not want to risk either set of cameras because they were going to be used in the future. So the answer was no. Sagan was undeterred. Four years later, in summer 1985, another opportunity appeared where he could take a picture of the Earth and also get Mars and Halley's Comet in the picture. Same response. Nope. Go away. Don't come back. Undeterred, Sagan asked in the spring of 1986 when well, there was a second opportunity to get these three objects in a picture, and the answer was exactly the same. Okay? In 1986 was when we had our Voyager 2 Uranus encounter. And it was in, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was. I think it was in January of 1986. And then in August of 1989 was the Neptune encounter. Um, so this was, this request here was timed to occur after the Uranus encounter. And after being told no, uh, took another two years before Sagan asked the project office if we could try it again, about a year before the Neptune encounter, when there was an opportunity to take a picture of the Earth and we could get Mars and Jupiter in the same picture. Same answer, nope. So I will never forget the day that I was coming out of the elevator in building 264 at JPL on the third floor, which is the floor that housed the Voyager science team, I'm doors open, I'm walking out of the elevator, standing in the hall with Sagan, who wants to get on the elevator and go somewhere else, but I pigeonholed him and asked, are you going to try and make this image request again, either before or more likely after the upcoming Voyager 2 Neptune encounter? And of course his answer was yes, with a great big Sagan smile. And so, I don't know why it happened, but a thought passed from this year to this year. And I said to him, well, if you're gonna try one more time to ask that we be allowed to take this observation, why don't we do the entire solar system? Not just the Earth, but the whole enchilada. He thought about that, smiled, shook his head, and then that became the basis for these last bunch of requests, the first of which was in the spring of 1989, about four months before the Voyager 2 Neptune encounter. We had an opportunity to catch, take images of Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune from Voyager 2, okay? Same answer. Nope, go away, don't come back, don't ask again. Undeterred, we decided to ask again, and we brought up the sixth request, which was the one that ultimately worked, okay? And so in 1989, in spring, 
There was the opportunity to take a set of images that would include the Sun, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Just about everybody, okay? And then after we got a, a provisional yes and designed the observation, uh, we decided, the hell, we'll go for the, we'll go for everything. We're gonna ask again if we can do, so we asked if we could do it with Voyager 1 after the Voyager 2 Neptune encounter. We made a final request in the spring of 1990, do all the same bodies, but from Voyager 2. And there's all kinds of interesting things you could do. If you had two sets of observations, you could put together a stereo products, you could get different um, viewpoints, learns all kinds of interesting things. The answer to that one was no, okay? So one out of seven worked. This was the normal reaction we got from the Voyager Project Office. The first five times we asked and the seventh time we asked, okay? I will never, ever forget being on the fourth floor of that same building, 264, when we made the sixth request and the deputy Voyager project manager was head of the body that would decide yes or no. And for the first time, since we were requesting take images of the entire solar system, the conversation was going toward yes. And at one point, the deputy project manager stands up, he's at the head of the table, he slams his fist down on the table and says, if this gets approved, I am leaving JPL. And <laughs> stormed out of the room. This is a true story. So, in the basket of life is never fair, right? This same guy, a year later, along with the Voyager project manager, they both got to go to the White House and present the results of this observation <laughs> to the President of the United States. I'm telling you, life is not fair. Okay, so here's a line drawing of the Voyager spacecraft. Whoops, I don't know what I do. Did I turn it off? Which one? I don't know either. I'm new to this, okay. All right, so no, that's fine. So big high gain antenna here, four meters in diameter. The science instruments over here, we're on a steer steerable platform so you could point them at something. The two cameras, we had two cameras, one with a wide angle lens and one with a narrow angle lens. So we could point those cameras at something that was of interest. Nice pretty artist rendering of the Voyager spacecraft. Both spacecraft, by the way, are still operational, still transmitting fields and particles, science instrument data 24 seven. We choose to listen every so often, not very, not very often. There's only one antenna on the planet that can still receive a Voyager 2 signal. That's the 70 meter dish in, uh, in Canberra, Australia. Don't think parks can receive the signal. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I doubt it. The only dish they use and have used for decades is the 70 meter at, uh, at Canberra. So this is a close up of the instruments that are on the ScienceScan platform. This is the narrow angle camera. The one has the telephoto lens, this is the wide angle camera. And then there's a couple of other spectrometers on there, which we did not use for the observation. So, Request number five had a really neat geometry. All the planets were all lined up in a line. That didn't happen very often, but that was one of the ones that was where we were told to go away and don't come back. So nothing happened. Okay, our objectives in designing the observation were, oh, I did it again. Huh? This? That'll, that one will work too. Um, Take a mosaic of the solar system containing the Earth, as many of the other planets as we could get, in color, including an image of the sun. Image of the sun, that would be the last two images would be of the sun, because we thought they would damage the cameras. Including wide angle stellar background images and minimize the risk to the spacecraft and all the other science instruments. 
So this is a plot that shows scattered light as you point the narrow angle camera closer and closer to the sun. You can see these are degrees, 10 degrees from the sun, one degree from the sun. You can see the scattered light intensity is building up. You don't go in, you get closer to the sun than a degree and all you see is scattered light. You don't get anything, you don't get a nice pretty image. Okay, so when the project office said yes, you can go ahead and design this observation. They didn't give us permission to do it, but they gave us permission to design it. They laid a bunch of constraints on us, okay? Couldn't interfere with the upcoming Neptune encounter. We had no interference in designing our observation with the other software that was being developed to run the Voyager 1 spacecraft. We were gonna be allowed to try this once from one of the two Voyager spacecraft. Uh, we were not allowed to use that big four meter dish as for shielding of sunlight. Up, oh, get it again. Okay. Um, we were allowed one attempt. Jeez, I'm, I'm not hitting that guy up there. I don't know what's going on. That's what I'm doing, I'm pressing the arrow. Yeah. We were allowed one attempt to get the images back, and we had to get each other science instrument that could be damaged to approve doing the observation. Okay, there were only a few times when we could actually do the observation. Every time the Earth was closer to the sun than one degree from the point of view of Voyager, you couldn't do the observation because you wouldn't be able to see the Earth, right? So these were the, these were the times Hi. Okay, yeah, why don't you do it? Yeah, that's, that's better. Okay, so go back one. Okay, so you can see the times when we got the crosshatch when the Earth is closer to the sun, like from in 1990 from April through June, couldn't do the image. Really, after October, we couldn't do the image because the Earth's too close to the sun. So there were really only time, two time periods. In 1990, from January to March, and from July to September. We ended up picking the one in the middle of February, the first of the two time periods. Next slide. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this one, keep going. I'm gonna skip this one too, there's a bunch of the resources we use. This was a design, this is how the observation was designed. I'm actually gonna use this, I don't wanna use the pointer. Okay, so we start here, and we step in, we take images of Neptune, step in to Uranus, take it, images of Uranus, step into Saturn, take images of Saturn, step down, take images of Mars, go around the sun, take images of Jupiter, come around this way, and then come back in and pick up all the planets that are real close to the sun, Earth, Venus, and finally the last couple of images were images of the sun. Okay, these are the various color filters that were used. It was really the same set of filters. And all we changed was the exposure. So for the planets that were far away from the sun, like Neptune and Uranus, we had to have a longer exposure. And for the planets that were real close to the sun, we had to have a shortest exposure we could get away with. Next slide. Oh, these are the various characteristics, how far each planet was away, what its phase angle was, how many pixels the big the planet was and the images we're gonna take and the apparent visual magnitude of each object. Next slide. Okay, so there's actually an error on this. I, as I was getting ready for this presentation, I was looking back through the slides and I noticed there's an error on this slide. It's also in the paper that was published on the 30th <laughs> anniversary of the actual observation. And the error is, these are the dates when we had the DSN, the Deep Space Network, 70 meter antennas scheduled to receive the image data, except all the passes, let's see if we can get this to work, all the passes were actually in 1990, because we took the observations on Valentine's Day in 1990. So these are all, these are 1989s are all wrong, and they're in the paper wrong. But anyway, the dates are correct. So February 14th, Valentine's Day was when we actually took the 64 images, it took five playbacks. Five playbacks were scheduled on March the 16th, March 20th, 23rd, 27th, 
uh, four play, four, I'm sorry, four playbacks were scheduled, okay? And the first one worked fine, the third one worked fine, the fourth one worked fine, the second one failed. First time it failed, I think it was because of rain, and the second time, so Voyager Project Office violated its own constraint because they said we only had one opportunity to get the data back. They said we could have a second try. So we scheduled that second playback for April 17th, and we had an equipment failure. So they relaxed the constraint one more time and let us try a third time. The third time was a charm. On May the 1st, we got, the la we got playback to data. So we had all the data. Next slide. This is uh, Ed Stone, the one and only Voyager project scientist from before launch to now. He's still the Voyager project scientist. This is Candy Hansen, my co-author, and Torrance Johnson. Um, Candy and Torrance were both on the imaging science team at JPL. And this is the mosaic that I'm going to show you the actual results of behind them. They printed each one of the pictures and tacked them up on a wall. <laughs> All the pictures. Next slide. Okay, so these are the narrow angle or high resolution images of each of the six planets that we could, could see. Okay, um, Venus, Earth, Earth ended up in a little ray of scattered light within the Voyager narrow angle camera. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uranus and Neptune are elongated because we had, we're taking 15 second exposures and spacecraft was moving back and forth. And so that's why they got smeared out. Next. The Earth, we are here. Next. Okay, so for the 30th anniversary of the observation, so the observation was in 1990, 30th anniversary was 2020, a, uh, an engineer at JPL went and reprocessed the three images that resulted in the pale blue dot image of the Earth. This is the reprocessed image. Go back one. So it's just, this is the same set of images. Go forward. Now with modern image processing software, there's the Earth right there. See how much better that looks? <laughs> Next slide. Okay, among the last images, the last two were of the sun, and he, in there, you can't really tell, but it's in there, is Venus, and right about there is the Earth. Next slide. There's the entire mosaic, 64 images all laid out. All the big images are the wide angle images, and then three narrow angle images and different color filters so we could re reconstruct a real life color of each planet. Uh, we took three images of Mars, but we couldn't see it. It's too small, too dark, very high phase angle, so we're only seeing a tiny lit crescent of Mars, and it's a small planet, so we couldn't see it. The imaging team didn't feel that it reliably detected Mars, so we didn't claim that detection. Next slide. Last slide. Okay, so the Voyager Grand Tour these are the, among the first images that were taken from Voyager 1 when it was close by the Earth. So this is obviously an image of the Earth. There's the moon. Um, so those were the, among the first images, back one. These were the last images taken by a Voyager spacecraft. After this observation, the cameras were turned off forever. So I said there were three opportunities when we had sent a spacecraft with enough energy to go beyond the solar system, and it had cameras, and we could turn them around and take pictures of, of our home solar system. Voyager 1 was the first opportunity. Voyager 2 was the second opportunity. We actually did it with Voyager 1. We asked to do it with Voyager 2, were turned down. Those cameras were turned off in 1990. They are dead. They're, you couldn't, we don't have the power to turn back on. I mean, if we did, they would have been, they're long dead, right? Third opportunity, is the New Horizons spacecraft. It's also leaving the solar system never to come back. It has cameras, narrow angle and wide angle cameras capable of making the same kinds of observations. So I have been pestering Alan Stern <laughs> for years. Are we gonna use New Horizons to redo this? 
and he's not he's been non-committal he's he's willing to entertain the idea of doing it once he knows he's never going to use those science instruments ever again he hasn't gotten there yet last time i asked him was in 19 was in 2020 and he said uh, get back to me in 5 years <laughs> so i'm going to get i'm going to get back to him <laughs> anyway this observation was done as a statement that this species had risen far enough out of the primordial ooze that it could send a spacecraft beyond its home solar system, turn it around, and take pictures as it was going away, never to return. That's it. <laughs> I hate this thing. Oh, maybe when we do this, maybe when we do this observation on New Horizons, some UTSA students <laughs> could be involved in it. <laughs> Just in the nick of time. Just in um, the nick of time. Yes, we have a few questions on the, on the phone, and if you have any in the room, either text them to me or, or raise your hands when we get to you. Um, the, um, the first question is, um, the, have, you, have you heard any rumors about the interstellar probe that they're trying to develop no. for the helio? No? No. No? No. OK. Um, why is Voyager 2 now so far away from Earth? We gave it enough energy that it's in orbit around the center of our galaxy. Just like Voyager 1 is, just like Pioneer 10 is, just like Pioneer 11 is, and just like New Horizons is. Very cool. All right, um, yes, question. <laughs> oh, it's just a stylistic orbit. It's actually a depiction of Kepler's second law. Um, equal areas are swept out in equal times throughout any part of an orbit. It, that's my company. That's the logo of my company. <laughs> a New York artist who's the twin brother of one of my best friends created that for me back in the 1990s. Yes, sir. So several things happened that had never happened before. The first five requests were just to take a picture of the Earth and whatever other interesting object would be in the picture, right? The project scientist, Ed Stone, never supported those first five observation requests. The senior management in the Voyager project considered them publicity stunts. No scientific merit whatsoever. After we expanded the nature of the observation to include the so entire solar system, for the first time, the project scientists supported the observation, and much more of the science team supported the observation. So that went a long way toward getting a yes, a provisional yes. There, there's, a, there's all kinds of stuff that went on behind the scenes I didn't tell you. Like, for example, the Voyager Project Office, I don't know how they came up with this number, but they decided they needed an extra $3 million for all the costs of designing the observation, doing the software testing, uplinking the observation, scheduling the DSN passes to get the data back. They were able, to, this happened in the summer of 1989, they were finally able to get headquarters to agree to provide the money. That was the last hurdle that we had to overcome to actually be allowed to do the observation. Yes, so for those online, that question was about uh, how did number six get the yes from NASA. Yes, uh, yes we have another question. What science was being done at those precedence? All right, the question is what science was being done by the Voyager spacecraft that took precedence over these beautiful pictures? Well, so the imaging cameras were designed 
to take pictures of dark objects far away from the sun. They were never designed to take images of pictures that were close to the sun. We had a flight rule that operated over the entire Grand Tour that we were not allowed to point the cameras any closer than 15 degrees to the sun because there was a fear they would get damaged. So these cameras, this Voyager narrow angle and wide angle cameras are the last Viticon tube cameras ever launched by NASA. The next uh, cameras that were launched by NASA were on Galileo, a Jupiter orbiter, and they were the first CCD, charge coupled device digital cameras ever launched by NASA. So the Voyager cameras were an old analog Viticron tubes and the risk was you point them close enough to the sun, you get too much energy, you're gonna, you're gonna burn out the tubes, you're gonna warp the shutters, the cameras are never gonna work again. Yes. When Voyager was being thought up and everything, was something like this thought of? Did no. anyone have this idea of no, no. turning it around? Sagan came up with the idea in 1981. And again, it was just to take either one or three images of the Earth. Sagan's reasoning was, you know, we're going a long way toward wrecking our only home. Sagan thought that if we used Voyager to take, in the best case, three images in diff through different color filters so we could reconstruct a natural color image of our home planet in the darkness of space, people would come to realize that we got this one planet, it's totally precious, we can't screw it up. So it was part of that campaign to not wipe ourselves out with nuclear war or biological catastrophe or chemical warfare or any one of the hundreds of other ways that we're capable of doing. Yes? Oh, good. Trace the life curve of the planet. Yeah. So for the, a question behind you. For, th for those online, just quickly, uh, the New Horizons spacecraft has taken backside images of Uranus and Neptune. So the first uh, far away of those and amateur astronomers are currently looking at them. So very cool. Thank you, Kurt. Yes. No, 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 no. It never went that high. It didn't have to go beyond NASA, but it did have to go to NASA headquarters. It absolutely had to get approved by NASA headquarters. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Perseverance sometimes <laughs> wins. Yes, that last question was pertaining of how high did, did they have to go? It was NASA HQ, not the president, to get the approval. Yep. Um, so, but still, Great job, and, and we have the, the pale blue dot is, of course, I think it's iconic. Um, so one real quick addendum. Um, I want to come out with another paper. I haven't really done much on it, but um, the same guy, I'll go back one. The same guy at JPL that re, I'll go back one more. One more, yeah. Same guy at JPL that reprocessed the original Voyager image data to come up with the pale blue dot version that you see here. I want to get that guy to reprocess all 64 images and redo the mosaic, and it'll look much more spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> you try to get that image. <laughs> all right, let's thank our speaker once again. And thank everyone, thank you for attending tonight. Of course, 
We've reached the end of the official program, but we have trivia. So for those of you sticking around, we will come around and pass out trivia sheets on this little mini break. Um, and for those of you that have to go, um, enjoy the eclipse. We will not see you before then. Um, so be safe. Make sure you wear your glasses. And um, feel free to stop by our public DPS events that we advertised at the beginning. We'd love to see you all there. Um, and stay tuned for trivia. Thank you very much.
with our trivia for the evening. As a reminder, once again, the max group size is four, with the exception of, of you all. There's the st separate student competition. Um, no cell phones allowed, naturally. Don't look up the answers, please. Keep it fair, keep it kosher. And only put down the letter for the multiple choice answers. It'll make it easier for us to grade them so we can get out of here quicker. Is everyone ready? All right, question one. The theme is also eclipses and Voyager, naturally. Central eclipses. A central solar eclipse is either an annular or total eclipse. What percentage of central eclipses are annular? A, 10%, B, 40%, C, 50%, D, 60%, or E, 90%. This is in contrast to partial eclipses. So you have central and partial. Central can be both total and annular because that means that it's covering the sun in some regard. So what percentage of all possible E, uh, um, central eclipses are annular. So it's a phase space question. <laughs> no, I mean like, you know, it's like. Is everyone good on this one? All right, moving on. Question two. There are at least blank solar eclipses per year and no more than blank solar eclipses per year. So put your letter, comma, letter. There are one. at least blank solar eclipses per year and no more than blank solar eclipses per year. So there's, at a minimum, a number and there is a maximum number of solar eclipses per year. So what is the minimum and what is the maximum? We'll give you some time on this one, it's a thinker. Also make sure you're putting the letters in the right spaces, you know, question one, question two, because just the way they're ordered on the trivia sheet, just wanna make sure. All right, is everyone good? Yeah. I heard a no, but we're moving on. We'll come back. We'll come back. Question three, a president's dream. Which US president says, we hope someday, having solved the problems we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations on Voyager's infamous, uh, not infamous, I'm sorry, famous, <laughs> famous golden record. Is it A, Gerald Ford, B, Jimmy Carter, C, Ronald Reagan, D, George Bush Sr., or E, Barack Obama. So this is a timing one. This is a timing question. Think about Voyager and the uh, timing of Voyager. Yeah, sure, it's, it's, it's definitely Barack Obama. Yeah. I wish you had Jor I wish you had W. He would, he would ask you something, huh? yeah. something, <laughs> having solved the problems we face. I'll tell you what, we're going to find Katrina and we're going to bring her down. We're going to bring her to justice. <laughs> A 
Everybody good? Did anybody else picture Obama saying this? We hope someday. <laughs> All right, question four. Thanks to Voyager, we know our solar system is in the local interstellar cloud, but not for long. We believe we will soon enter what other dust cloud? Is it A, the G cloud? Is it B, the small Magellanic cloud? C, the large Magellanic cloud? D, the Ursa Major cloud? Or E, the dark cloud? Bonus, which nearby star in this cloud is the sun moving toward? So answer the question with your letter, and if you want to take a stab at the bonus, write in the name of the star next to it. And write, yeah, write it next to it on the line. Don't write it in the bonus lines, because that's for the bonus question. Once again, you'll confuse us grading it. It's late. We won't. <laughs> Lots of beer. <laughs> you late know. in the day. It's Give us a break. All right, everybody good? Moving on to question five. Near light speed travel. This is a simple A or B question. Which Voyager is moving faster? B, I'm sorry, A, Voyager one, wait, or B, Voyager two? You have two, two, 50-50 chat at this one. 50-50. And, and this one, the, the only hint I'll give you on this one is think about what they did. Think about what? What they did. Oh. The bonus has a lot of writing on the right side, so I think All right, um, we'll move on. This is a quick one, so. It's a 50-50, so. Yeah. All right, question six, Voyager on TV. Voyager 6, a fictitious spacecraft determined to destroy Earth, can be seen in which popular 1979 science fiction film? Is it A, Star Trek, the motion picture, B, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, C, Alien, D, The Andromeda Strain, or E, Solaris? Solaris, Solaris. All right, Solaris. We don't we don't sponsor Toyota. <laughs> they don't. They yeah, don't, Toyota they don't doesn't sponsor us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now we're getting complicated. <laughs> All right, are we good on this one? Um, um, before we go to the bonus, we'll go back through the questions quickly. So question one uh, was about the central solar eclipse. 
Is everybody going on this one? Yes? yes? Or, or if anybody's not good, yell no. You got five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, question two about the annular eclipses. Is, everybody, is anybody not good? Minimum and maximum. Yell no. No no's. Question three. The president. Yell no if you don't have it. Question four. Our neighborhood. Oh, this one had, and this one had the bonus. Yell no if you don't have it. Question five. It's a 50-50, come on. One or two. <laughs> a or B. And finally, six. Any no's? All right, the bonus. For tonight, apparently it's a little, little wordy, so bear with us. Only four of the 11 measuring systems on board Voyager 1 are still active. Which ones? So I will list out all 11 imaging systems. A, the imaging system detector. B, the radio science system. C, the infrared spectrometer investigation. D, the ultraviolet spectrometer. Woo! E, the flux gate magnetometer. F, the plasma spectrometer. G, the low energy particle detector. detector. H, the cosmic ray subsystem. I, the planetary radio um, investigation for the aliens that, you know, send us their sports talk. Um, <laughs> J, uh, photo, fo photo polarimeter system. And K, the plasma wave subsystem. Each right answer will give you a half a point for a maximum of two. We have a little bit of, like, weirdness going on with the conversion of slides, so... A is correct, B is correct, C is just infrared spectrometer, and then I is the planetary radio uh, investigation. Oh, yeah, that's, I thought imaging system detector was weird. So A, A is just the cameras. Yeah, A is imaging system, B is low energy. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Caleb. Very yeah. good. Google. The Google suite of PowerPoint, Word, and Excel is actually not that good. No. Microsoft de definitely cornered the market on that one. Google, Google suite sucks. It, it's okay mail, for right, like... Yes, and when you're done, come bring up, uh, come bring up your sheets. We'll start grading them um, and go on a little break. If I gave you a pen, please return the pen. Um, please return the pen. We don't have an infinite quantity, so be generous. Thank you. This one might take some feedback. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, take your time on this one. We'll start grading while you are finishing. Whenever you're done with your trivia sheet, please bring them up so we can start grading them and with your pens, with the pens we gave you as well. Thank you.
So if I can have your attention, please, as we go quickly through the answers for question one, which was about the central eclipses, the percentage that are annular, that percentage is D, 60%. The moon is on average smaller than the sun as seen from Earth, so the slight majority of central eclipses are in fact annular. Today you learned. Question two. Which was uh, the double, the annular? Oh yes, the minimum and the maximum. Minimum of two per year and a maximum of five per year. Don't ask me why. So these are more common than you might think. Oh, yeah. If, if you're interested, go look at the map that shows like the, the eclipses um, like every year. And if you look at them like on a global scale, like projected to a flat, it, the curves are interesting because of the, we live on a, it's not flat, I swear. <laughs> question three. Um, all right, question three, which was about the presidents. Which president has the statement on the golden record? That would we be B, Jimmy Carter, Mr. Peanut himself. That was a more or less a history question. All right, question four. The, the star, the, the neighbor, uh, our neighborhood. Oh, yeah, what cloud are we moving into? G cloud. And what, what star? Altair. Don't ask me why. So, no, I do not yes, why. this will be happening um, still in many years, so don't, don't hold your breath. We're not entering the. Not as long as you might think, but <laughs> you're not going to be alive, trust me. No realty options. Um, all right, question five, which was Voyager 1 or Voyager 2? Who's, the answer was... Who's the speediest? Voyager 1. And I believe... Uh, w uh, William can correct me, but I believe it's because it had less maneuvering to do. So, no? Oh, it was launched on a faster trajectory. Okay. Oh, it, okay, so it did run. There you go. It was just faster, huh? Does anybody? Oh, it was 17 kilometers per second. Look at that. That's pretty darn fast. 15. Voyager 2 is about 15 kilometers per second. A minor, a minor thing. If anybody's interested in this at all, look up spacecraft velocities and the term delta V. You'll learn a whole lot about how spacecraft work and how we actually do this stuff. And it's you'll be converted to the dark side of rocketry. Yeah. Question six. The fictitious Voyager 6, what movie? Star Trek. The motion picture. Yes, yes. <laughs> 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 All right, the bonus, the bonus, which, which four instruments are still active? I'll say this, we got a little bit of a tell from William that the imagers are, they're gone, kaput. So we have the flux gate magnetometer, the low energy particle detector, the cosmic ray subsystem, and the plasma wave subsystem. Those are the four remaining active instruments on Voyager 1. So, that part of the night where we have the results of our trivia. So as always, first I'll announce the winner of the UTSA student competition. It is with pleasure to say that the Wonder Grads back there, Wonder Grads, the Wonder Grads came in second to the grad students. <laughs> Congrats, grad students. As There's it, just two grads tonight. <laughs> All right. With our third place prize of the night, winning a couple of postcards here from Robert Reeves of the Moon, um, you will win 
you will win uh, one postcard per team member. Right, one postcard per team member? Okay. Um, the solar tips. Come get your prize. Congratulations. Round of applause. Congrats again. In second place, in second place is a team that has a very creative name. I appreciated this name, especially because it was relevant. Kurt brought it up. It is the backside pictures of Uranus. Some might say Uranus, but this lovely poster, this lovely poster. Oh, wait, the training cards. You also get training cards. There you go. All right. Drum roll for the first place winner of the night. Star Masters. A Deep Impact mug and the trading cards. Okay, well. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else can win them next time. That brings us to the end of our program. Thank you all for attending. As a reminder, our next AOT is November, November 1st. But in October, please feel free to attend our public DPS events. We've got three great ones that you all will have a blast. Of course, Tracy's is the best, so. If you want to be reminded, join the email list. Yes. We'll and tell you when the next AOT is happening, either one day or one week before, it depends. And thank you again to Blue Star for hosting us, our servers, thank you, and the Southwest Research Institute for supporting us. Uh, if anybody wants merchandise, we'll be up here for a few minutes before we wrap up. Thank you. Yes. We have punch cards. A con a no one got a punch card. Though.